Hey guys, we're back and we're doing lesson 62. It is on God created Japan and I'm excited about it. I think it looks really cool. So let's just dive in. We're on page 412 in our text and we'll have our lesson review book out and that is page 31. And the first question is, how many islands make up Japan? And the second question for number one is, how many islands make up 98%? of its land area. So when you hear those answered, whew, when you hear those questions answered, feel free to start writing. But um, if you don't hear them, no worries, I'm gonna point them out. So why don't we get started? Japan is an island nation that stretches from north to south over 1,500 miles along the coast of Asia. The Korean Peninsula lies just to the west of southern Japan across the Sea of Japan. The closest point in Japan to Korea is about 124 miles across the Korean Strait. Russia's Sakhalin Island is about 31 miles from northern Japan, and the mainland of Russia is nearby. To the east and south of Japan is the Pacific Ocean. Now, we live on the Atlantic Ocean side. So essentially, you know, Hawaii is California, on the other side of the United States is California, and then there's that Pacific Ocean. Hawaii is in the middle, and on the other side of Hawaii, uh, you have Japan. So it's kind of, if you look at a globe, I'm sure it's just right on the other side of the world. Japan covers about 146,000 square miles, which is slightly smaller than the state of Montana. That just goes to show you how big kind of the U.S. is compared to some of these other countries. Um, Japan is a little bit smaller than our home state, not our home state, but the U.S. state of Montana. All right. It's slightly, slightly larger than Germany, and that kind of gives you an idea of how big Germany is too. All right. The country of Japan consists of nearly 4,000 islands. Let me say that again for the people in the back. The country of Japan consists of nearly 4,000 islands. Is that the answer to number one? It is, because the question was, how many islands make up Japan? And nearly 4,000 is your answer for number one. Again, the answer for number one is nearly 4,000, and it's on page 412. That's the answer to the first part of the question. The second part is how many islands make up 98% of the land area? Um, and it answers it in the second part of the sentence. But just four islands comprise 98% of its land area. So just four. So the first part of question number one is nearly 4,000 islands. And the second part is the number four. All right, good job. Um, as seen on the satellite image, and that's on page 14, go ahead and look at the image of the um, Japan area. Um, Hokkaido is in the northern post, northernmost of the four. Honshu is the largest island. Shikoku and Kishu are smaller and lie to the southwest. And you can see that on the map. Oh, it's got a really pretty picture of Mount Fuji. We'll talk about that in just a second. Honshu is the location of the so-called Japanese Alps. The highest point in the country is Mount Fuji. And there's the picture and you can see the cherry blossoms. That's so pretty. Um, yeah, I love that. Uh, Fuji is a dormant volcano which reaches 12,388 feet. Most of the islands are peaks of undersea mountains. That is so cool. Can you guys picture mountains being underwater? Um, there's this uh, show called Drain the Oceans on Disney, uh, the Disney app. And it's really cool because what they do is they uh, computer generate what it would look like with ruins that are in the ocean. So they drain the oceans and you can see these ruins that have been buried for thousands of years. And so a lot of times there's these mountains all in the water that you just didn't even know were there. There are mountains in the oceans. It's really neat. Anyways, the country has about 200 volcanoes. 60 of those are active. I should say 60 of those they think are active because remember they thought Pompeii was a dormant volcano, but it wasn't. So 60 of those are active. And of course, active means that they can erupt. There's activity going on within those volcanoes. Japan also has over 1,000 small earthquakes every year. That'd be a lot. Earthquakes are when the earth shakes. And I think we've had a couple here in North Carolina, but it's not very, um, it doesn't happen very often here. 
75% of the country is mountainous and 70% of the land area is covered with forests. Japan's lowlands are mostly small areas near the coast. The rivers in the country are shallow, swift, and short and can only be navigated for short distances. Weather conditions tend to be cold and snowy in the north, but more moderate in the south. Of course, in the north, it's probably more mountainous, it's colder, you can see the snow on top of Mount Fuji right there, and then what it's saying is towards the south, it's a little bit warmer, it's not as cold. Two ocean currents affect the weather of Japan. The Kurushio current flows up from the south and brings warmer air, while the Oishio current flows down from the colder northern Pacific. Cold winds from Asia blow across Japan in the winter. And we're gonna turn the page and warm. Oh. <laughs> warm winds blow from the Pacific in the summer. Japan experiences strong storms and typhoons. Typhoons is, that's a lot of water. The islands of Japan have a very diverse array of wildlife. While I read about the wildlife, I'm gonna let you guys look at them on page 414 and 415. There's a ton, look at the monkey drinking water. So cute. All right, the islands of Japan have a diverse array of wildlife. They are on the flyway of many migrating birds. So you know that my birds migrate when it starts to get cold, so they're on that flight pattern. About 600 species of birds have been identified there. That's a lot. Among ja Japan's amphibians is the Japanese giant salamander, and there's an illustration of it um, on page 414. It grows to a length of four feet or more. Okay, you can find salamanders here in North Carolina. If you lift a rock, a lot of times you'll see salamanders, and they're so cute, right? They're like maybe this big. I think the biggest one I've ever seen is this one here four feet. A yardstick's three feet, so I can't even get it in my camera. It's those, that's huge. How would you like to find a, a huge salamander in a rock like that? I don't think I'd like to find that. That'd probably freak me out. Among many, among the many land mammals native to Japan is the Japanese makaku, also known as the snow monkey. Oh, maybe that's the monkey that's drinking the water. That's so cute. The waters of the Pacific near Japan are home to whales, dolphins, porpoises, salmon, sardines, tuna, trout, cod, and many other species. Native birds, animals, and sea creatures are pictured. You, you've been looking at them, I hope. They're so cute, so fun. It looks really pretty. I think I'd wanna go there. Japan looks like a pretty cool place. All right, let's turn the page. Now, let's move on to, whoa, I lost you. Hold on, I'm gonna put you right here. <laughs> Can you see? There we go. Question number two, what nation has had a major influence in Japanese culture, language, religion, and art. And we're on page 416 if you want to follow along. China has strongly influenced Japan's culture, language, religion, and art. Well, look at that. It just answered itself. So question number two, the answer is China. Thank you, China. All right. Archaeologists. Okay, that's the answer to number two if you need to hit pause. Archaeologists have found evidence of people living on the islands well before the time of Christ, but the earliest reference to Japan is written historical records are in Chinese sources from about the first century before Christ. That's a long time ago. That's so cool. All right, let's read question number three before we go on. Question number three is, what does the word Shinto mean? I don't know. Let's find out what the word Shinto means. Okay, because Japan is made up of mountainous islands, people lived in small isolated kingdoms. Researchers estimated that as many as 100 kingdoms existed in Japan, mostly made up of clans and led by clan leaders. Records indicate that these clans paid tribute to China. These clans believed in many gods. Over time, the Japanese developed the religion or worldview uh, or philosophy that came to be known as Shinto. All right, here we go. The word Shinto means the way of the divine or mystical power. So the answer for number three is the way of the divine or mystical power. That's what it means. All right. All right, let's keep going. It has no founder, no scriptures, and no established set of teaching. Instead, it has traditional set of values, a way of thinking, and accepted religious practices. 
based on understanding of the spiritual realm, all of them, all of which the Japanese invented over time. According to Shinto philosophy, people recognized the wonders of creation, but they came to believe that gods lived in nature. People believed that each family had a guardian deity, a guardian god, that deserved respect. A family's farmer farming activities included rituals that recognized the family god. So each family had its own little god. Um, that's a false god. People built shrines where they believed the local god lived. As individuals, families gained political and military power. Their deities, their gods, received greater respect or homage. Okay. The Yamato period. Let's hear about the Yamato period. In the 200s and 300s AD, a clan from the Yamato Plain on Honshu Island began to dominate other clan kingdoms and to unify them under their rule. This leading clan claimed that they descended from the sun goddess. This caused other Japanese to honor them. The Yamati people built large tombs. Tombs are where you put people after they die. In these tombs, researchers have discovered pottery, figurines, jewelry, armory, and weapons, indicating that the Yamati leaders were wealthy and powerful and that they apparently engaged in battle as mounted warriors with bows and arrows and long iron swords. The Yamati learned the Chinese form of central government, the Chinese system of writing, and the thoughts of Confucius. Remember Confucius, we talked about him in earlier lessons. All right. Also, we talked about how a lot of um, and men, even in Egypt, they would fill their tombs uh, with very expensive things, treasures, because they thought that it would, either would protect them in the afterlife or they could take them with them in the afterlife. And so that's maybe what the Yamati people uh, thought when they found all those artifacts in the tombs. Okay, question number four. Are you ready? How did government officials under Tah Tahishi gain their position? How did government officials, people who were in charge in government, under Tahishi gain their position? So we learned about in Rome, a lot of times people would bribe their way in. Do you remember that? Before the Justinian law, people would try to give money to emperors so that they could, they could govern. But we're going to find out how the Tahishi people gained access to their positions in government. All right. The Sogo, Soga and Tahishi Shotuko, Shotuko, Shotuka, Shotuka. The centralized control of Yamato Dynasty began to break down in the 500s, and the Japanese government became very unstable. Unstable means it wasn't good, wasn't steady. Other clans grew more powerful. One of these was the Sogo, Soga. Empress Suko of the Soga clan came to the throne in 587 after the death of her brother. Oh, okay, it's a her. Emperor Yomi, okay, the death of her brother, Emperor Yomi. Yomi's son, Tahishi Shitoku, Shitoku became crown prince and prince regent in 593. The title of crown prince meant that he was next in line to become emperor. And the title of Prince Regent meant that he really led the government, even though his aunt was Empress. So he led the government, even though she was the Empress. Tahishi had a huge influence on Japan. He resumed contact with China, which had been discontinued some years earlier. So they had cut off um, contact with Japan for whatever reason some years earlier. Tahishi respected Chinese ideas. He brought Chinese clerks, artisans, which are artists, and craftsmen to Japan and adopted the Chinese calendar. Tahishi developed a system of government services that recognized 12 ranks of officials, each identified by a different color of caps that the officials wore. The new system recognized the merit or qualifications of the office holders instead of allowing people to hold government offices just because they were related to a high-ranking government official. Okay, there's our answer to question number four. How did government officials under Tahishi gain their position? Well, under Tahishi, they gained position by being recognized for their merit and qualification. All right, merit meaning they were really good at what they did, honest, trustworthy, Qualifications, meaning they knew what they were talking about. They knew what they were doing. So that's the answer. The, the way that they gained it 
was because they had they had merit and qualifications. That's on page 417 in the third paragraph if you need help spelling that. The new system recognized the merit or qualifications of the office holders, whereas before they just allowed um, high ranking, you know, oh wait, the people to hold government office just because they were they were related to somebody that was already high ranking. So this way, it was more about merit and qualifications. Okay, let's keep reading. That's good. This was another change that came as a result of contact with China. Tahishi also began building a system of roads to connect the people of Japan with each other, and he oversaw the first written history of Japan produced with in Japan. Tahishi wanted to establish the ideal government. In 604, he announced the 17-article constitution. This document promoted the ideas of Confucius, a largely copied and largely copied the Chinese system government. Tahishi promoted the Buddhist religion in Japan. He oversaw the building of many Buddhist temples, including the temple that's pictured right here on 417. It was completed um, in 607. That's neat. Okay. It is one of the oldest surviving wooden structures in the world. Whoa, that's amazing. Many Japanese practiced uh, both Buddhism and Shinto, Shinto in that building, I guess. Tahishi never became emperor, but remained the role of prince regent until his death in 622 because his aunt, Suko, was still living and serving in the role of empress when he died. After Tahishi's death, that's interesting because he was supposed to be emperor and he acted like emperor, but because his aunt was still alive, it's kind of like in England today. We have Queen Elizabeth, who's awesome, right? Her son, Charles, is going to be king when she dies, but they're both very old. Queen Elizabeth's like in her late 90s, and I think Charles is 70 or he's, he's getting up there in age. So anyways, it would be like in Prince Charles right now, pretty much runs England. Even though his mother is queen and she's in charge, he pretty much does it for her because she's quite a bit older. If he were to die now, he would have never been king, even though he acted like king, but he, because his mom's still alive. Same thing with here. Um, Tahishi never became emperor because his aunt outlived him, even though he acted like emperor. Okay. So where were we? After Tahishi's death, Japan went through another period of instability. See how rulers, like people that really have level heads and have um, things that are gonna help the people and aren't just thinking about themselves but are trying to help the actual people that they're ruling, they, they provide stabi sta <laughs> stability for nations. So he dies and then there's instability, which means kind of everything's, uh, in turmoil. Around 645, a new group defeated Soga. Nakino Oi led this group. The Japanese called the period Teike, which means great change. Emperor Nakino U declared the individuals no longer owned land. Instead, the emperor claimed to own it all. Hmm, sounds like a dictatorship. And his government assigned farmland to people. The people then had to pay taxes to the emperor to use the land. They have now, so the land that they own for generations is no longer theirs. This new emperor comes in, he says, that's not your land anymore, that's my land. And in fact, you're gonna pay taxes now to live on my land. That doesn't sound very fair to me. Naki no U also modeled his government after um, government in China. He sent many government workers to China to receive training. The government conducted a census. It organized and reformed the Japanese code of law, making it possible for individuals to appeal a legal case to the emperor. The Nara period. In 710, the city of Nara became the capital of Japan. Emperor Shomu, who ruled from 724 to 756, made Buddhism the state religion. He ordered each province to build a nunnery for Buddhist nuns and a monastery for Buddhist monks. Now, Buddhist nuns are women that choose to go into these um, nunneries and study their religion. And Buddhist monks are men that do the same thing, but they're men, and they go into um, monasteries. He required each province to build a statue of Buddha, 
Artists completed the Great Buddha of Nara in 752. It was 53 feet tall, made of 500 tons of bronze and covered with gold. Can you guys remember a different lesson where they built a huge statue of somebody? You guys remember that? And there were three men that refused to bow down to that statue. Do you guys remember that lesson? Hmm. Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys? And, and they were supposed to bow down to the statue, and they said, no, we're not going to do it. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going in the fire, and he turned that fire up so hot that even the guards that were throwing him into the fire died. The guards did. But they said, even if our God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, remember this story, guys? We still aren't going to bow to your statue. We're still not going to bow to you. They threw him in the fire and the king looks in and how many people does he? He doesn't see three people. He sees four in the fire. Jesus was with them. He did not leave them, did he? All right, back to Japan. God sent Jesus as the savior of the world. The Psalms and the Old Testament remind us often that the Lord is over the whole earth. Despite man's intervention, hey Joel, of many religions and despite the attempts of individuals to gain control over others, the Lord is really the one who rules our world. Okay, let's look at that fifth question. What are some different motives a leader might have for bringing about great change in society? That really just means what are the different things that a person who's in charge, okay, like in charge of a city, in charge of a state in charge of the country, um, what are some ideas that they might have that they think would bring about change either for themselves or for the people? And um, there are lots of examples of that. Maybe you can even ask mom and dad what they think about that question and what their answer might be. You could just put their answer down. All right, so we're done with lesson review. We're gonna go to student workbook and it's lesson 62, which means it is page 62. Let's go over these questions real quick, okay? And we're gonna draw lines to the correct answer. That's what it says. What is the largest island in the nation of uh, uh, Japan? Okay, let's see. I love the way they talk, it's awesome. And um, they're very, very smart. If they speak English and they have an accent, a lot of times people write that off, but that just means they're really smart because they can speak two languages. I can't speak two languages. Can you speak two languages? So when somebody, that's different than you has a little accent, you might think that's weird or that that might not sound as smart, but the fact of the matter is, is they're actually really smart because they speak two different languages. That's pretty amazing. All right, what is the largest island in the nation of Japan? And that's on page 413, you can look on there. And if you're looking at those islands, you would know that the largest island is Hunchu. All right, Hunchu, H-O-N-S-H-U, draw that line. What is the northernmost of Japan's four largest islands? Again, if you're looking at the map, just go whoop, north is up. And it's Hokido, uh, I wrote it down, Hokido. Hokido is the largest island. What is the highest point in Japan? And we know that it's Mount, like the apple, Fuji, good. All right. What word means the way of the divine or mystical power? And we learned in that lesson that it is Shinto, right? Shinto. The Yamato clan claimed to be descended from who? Do you guys remember? That's on page, the Yamato clan, it's on page 416. They thought they were a descendant. It's really bright, it warms the earth. They thought a sun goddess, right? Good. What position did Tahashi hold under Empress Tsuko, who was his aunt? And he was the prince regent, right? Okay, Nakano U was leader of Japan during the era known as what? That era was known as, if you said the great change, you are correct. Number eight, what city became the capital of Japan in 710? It was the last par or the last section, I should say, that we read. Yeah, last paragraph. On page 14, it's the Nara period. The Nara period. All right, lesson 62, and we're done. And I will see you next time for lesson 63. Oh, you know what? Don't forget your timeline, and there is no maps for this, so that's great. Make sure you're looking for timeline and maps. And I hope that you got your test done 
for unit 12. Remember, it's in the back of your student workbook, in the back of your lesson, because I'll be grading that when we get back from Thanksgiving. Yum, yum. All right, talk to you guys soon. Bye.